talking about. So thank you for staying for the tour afternoon. And what we are looking at here is a jigs Bermuda grass field. And we're gonna talk about the study that we've been doing here uh, for the past two years. First of all, let me just explain what we are looking at. I think from where you guys are, you can probably see these two flags. And those two flags, see where this area where I'm standing. Do you notice some difference in the color of the grass compared to this very next one? Yeah, a, this is another plot. Can anybody guess what the difference? Don't take a peek in the back because I have the answer here. So <laughs> let's not cheat. What is the difference between this plot here? The same species, and it actually, uh, uh, at the end of the tour, if you want to walk here, it's the stubble height you. that it was cut at. I'm sorry, sir? What is it, the stubble height that it was cut at? Is that the difference? Stubble height that was cut at. No. no. Okay. Good no. job. No. I'm going to tell you, if you cannot see this, this plot where I'm standing at has much more weeds. <laughs> it was herbicided in the spring. No, it was not herbicide. Remember, I'm a soil scientist. By the way, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I see a lot of familiar faces. I look at people, I imagine that everybody knows me, but I understand not everybody knows me. Are you the mother of the bad twin? <laughs> <laughs> so, my husband, is, he, he doesn't understand that I'm always the last one, because this is the most important talk of the day. <laughs> And I always have an opportunity to reply what he says. <laughs> so anyway, he lies a lot. <laughs> Back to the point. I'm a soil scientist, so there might be something related to fertility. Any other guess? pH? I'm on a nitrogen. It kind of looks like different nitrogen. But let me tell you, we can spend the whole afternoon guessing what it is. This study, and Ed Jennings is in this tour. He can back me up. The difference between these two plots is the amount of potassium that I apply. So back two years ago, can everybody see this? Yep. I'm going to have to do a little dance here because so everybody. So this is 80 pounds of K2O per acre. This one, the green one. And the one behind me received no potassium for the past two years. So what is the issue that we're trying to study here? We know that all Bermuda grass, including the jigs, require potassium. And actually, we can talk about edugenes issue in Central Florida, a lot of the hay fields collapsing because of potassium deficiency. But we also recognize that the IFAS uh, potassium recommendation might not be economical for most producers. So let me just uh, remind you what the IFAS recommended rate is. If you have established Bermuda grass pasture, the recommended rate is between 40 and 80 pounds of K2O per acre. It depends on your soil test. If you have medium uh, levels in the soil, it's 40. If you have low or very low, which I bet that 99% of you will have very low or low potassium in the soil, uh, the recommended rate is 80 pounds. If you are cutting hay, the recommendation is for 80 pounds of K2O, K2O after each cut. How many of you can afford 80 pounds, let's say if you harvest four times or three times a year, how many of you can, <coughs> can afford 240 pounds of K2O, K2O per year? No, not many people. So the, the object of this study was to determine how much we can cut down the potassium uh, fertilization we, without impact, without impacting the yield, but more importantly, impacting the sand. After after we finish talk, if you wanna take a look here, we are losing the sand in these plots that are not receiving potassium, and we are doing that in purpose, on purpose. We wanna see how far we can take these hay fields without potassium application and still maintain the, <coughs> the stand. Which in this case, two years, we are basically killing killing the grass. So. Again, what we're looking at in this area are a combination of different nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus applications. So we have two nitrogen rates, 80, and the plots in my back receive 160 pounds of nitrogen to the acre, divided into two split applications. And these are the potassium and the phosphorus recommendation uh, on a year base. So we, har we harvest these plots four times last year. So far in 2000,
2013, we harvest three times. So we have one more harvest before we finish the 2013 season. And we only apply 0, 40, and 80 pounds of K2O <coughs> per acre per year. So we apply that, those rates in 2012. We apply again in 2013. Well, it's, it's almost, you don't, almost don't have to do any analysis or co collect any data because it's visual. And if you look across the field, you see differences in color. And it probably, if I show you the crop lands or how the treatments were divided, it probably the areas that are not so good probably coincide with the plots that didn't receive any potassium fertilization. But let me show you some data. These are the yields. Again, I have to do a little dance here. Uh, can everybody see here? I'll show, I'll, I'll move around. But let me show you these folks here first. 2012, the blue bars are no potassium application. By the way, we have four reps within this field for each treatment. 40 pounds, and this is 80 pounds. This is an average across all phosphorus and nitrogen rates. You see there's some marginal increases in the cumulative gear production as a function of potassium application. Again, this is zero, 40, and 80 pounds. You increased the production in 2012, but not quite that much. I don't, we didn't do any economic analysis to see whether this increase in production, 44% will be economical based on the price of the fertilizer, which by the way, potassium is the most expensive fertilizer. But look at what happened in 2013. Our yields went down. So the controls went down. Yields were reduced much more than the treatments that are receiving potassium, but still, if I compare, the plus that received 40 pounds last year with 40 pounds this year, mm. the two red bars, yields are going down. And basically the reason for that, if we look at the tissue and the soil analysis, basically the reason for that is because I'm simulating a situation where potassium is becoming deficient in this pasture. So how about a very common situation, especially if we're talking about grazing situation. Sometimes we only look at nitrogen application. So how about now I only apply nitrogen? I'm double. I'm, I'm applying twice as much. We have 80 pounds of nitrogen, no potassium, and we have six, 160 pounds. Look at the data. Uh, let me see if I'm looking correct. Yeah. Look at the data, 2013. This is 80 pounds. This is 160 pounds. 80 pounds versus 160 pounds of nitrogen. Only nitrogen. Basically, what I'm telling you with these numbers, and remember 2013 we have one more harvest, so it might be a little bit higher than this, but not much. We, as you can see, there's not much forage growth. This was harvested four weeks ago. So in two weeks, we're gonna harvest again. I suspect that it's not gonna produce much. But anyway, what I'm trying to show with this data, show you with this data is that I doubled the amount of nitrogen I apply. So cost, I increased my cost of production. And the, and the forage production actually went down. So again, if you have bahia grass, it might be a different story. But if you have any type of Bermuda grass, including jigs, Stifton 85, coastal Bermuda grass, and you don't apply potassium, you're only focused on nitrogen fertilization, you might be uh, in this scenario where the production is being limited by something else. Uh, yes. And again, I think it's very clear, if only look, by looking at the plot, you can see the differences in color. We also measure crude protein digestibility. And like I said, every year, after, after the end of the year, usually in November, we come and collect soil samples. Uh, crude protein and digestibility was also affected by potassium. The higher the potassium, the better, the higher the crude protein, and the better the, the digestibility. Uh, we also, because lipograss, appears to be very similar to the Bermuda grass as far as uh, fertility requirements. We also conducted another study. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to go to this site today, but I'm sorry, here goes, the lipograss. <clears throat> Basically the same PNK treatments. The only difference we did in, with the lipograss, because lipograss sometimes is used as a stockpile forage, we also this decided to do some different uh, harvest uh, strategies. So we harvest twice a year, or we harvest a lipograss four times a year. Uh, and we try to evaluate how that harvest 
frequency affected the plant response to PNK uh, fertilization. And basically, let me show one of the, the results were about the same. Here it goes. This is the lymphograss yield. Again, 2012, 2013. 2013 is not, the growing season is still going on. We have one more harvest, so it's not, the, this is not the final production. So we're comparing four harvests here versus three harvests here. But what I want to show you, 2012, the potassium levels in their soil were relatively good, especially considering that Florida soils, they were in the medium range. It took, it, it took us only one year to uh, create a potassium deficiency in the soil. So we harvest in 2012, we harvest this lymphograss fields four times, at six weeks frequency. Look at what happened with the yields in 2013. Much lower yields. It's still there's a, a response as you increase the potassium. This is 40, this is 80 pounds of 40 and 80 pounds of K2O per acre. You increase it, but not quite as much as the yields that we obtained in 2012. So again, in a, we will continue this for another year, 2014. We're gonna have the 30 year of data just to confirm that the results are the same. But what I suspect is gonna happen, the bars in 2014 will be even lower. So we wanna see how far we can go with this experiment until we can completely kill the stand. The answer for the original question we were trying to address is how much can we cut back the IFAS recommendation without impacting? Yield and stand? I think the answer is we cannot. Right now, even at the 80 pounds rate, we, we are observing some reduction in the yield. So the bottom line is uh, if you decide to establish, with the cost of establishment for uh, uh, fields like this is extremely high, uh, you need to keep in mind that these plants will require potassium. We cannot simply, uh, especially for cutting hay, we cannot simply. Uh, neglect the potassium fertilization. <clears throat> so, uh, you are welcome to walk around, but uh, any questions so far? <laughs> and we noticed, well, it's this year in particular, Ed Gini is here, the livestock agent in Sumter County. Uh, a lot of hay fields in his area, in the central part of the state, were basically, we're calling collapsing. And he has some very nice pictures of fields that uh, basically were dead and they received potassium application. How, how long was the, the period you had? Four, six weeks after? About four weeks. Four weeks. They, he took the pictures. Harvest, of, yeah, those, some of those fields were pretty much dead in May. I mean, there was very, very little material there I mean, after the application. Of course, it rained after that as well. And they harvested hay in late June. So anyway, it's it's an um, it's it is it is important to keep in mind that if you, if especially for a harvesting of hay, potassium need to be put back as a fertilizer and probably a higher rate than we're doing uh, here. Any questions? I just want to briefly mention about the the subject that the paper that I wrote in the in the field day book which is a lot of different than what we're looking at in the field, but I, I thought it was a good opportunity to us to show what we're doing and uh, the results we are, we are obtaining. You're probably gonna see an article in the uh, Florida Academy Magazine about this study, but like I said, we'll continue for another year. This year has been unusual because we had, like I said, we had the frost in March and it's been pretty wet. So for instance, one of the, one of the questions I had one gentleman asking me in the first group was, when you apply potassium, do you see the response in the first harvest? Remember, I harvest is plot four times last year and three times this year. It, it depends, it varies year by year. For instance, if you remember last year, we had a fairly dry spring. So the first harvest was basically, there was no difference uh, among the treatments. Basically, with potassium or no potassium, the, the, the production was the same. The second harvest, when we got more rain, that's where we saw the differences in the treatments. This year, because it was a little bit wetter, Throughout the uh, entire growing season, the plots that uh, received more potassium produced more than the one that didn't. So, but on a year basis, what it produced, the cumulative production on a year basis was greater in 2012, and it's gonna be greater in 2013 as well. 
back to my comment on the uh, article on the booklet. It's on uh, testing your soil and your plant tissue. When, when we recommend producers to do the soil tissue testing, usually there's not a, a ideal time of the year to do that. But, but there are a couple issues to, to consider. For instance, if you, this particular soil, the pH is a little in the alkaline side. The pH here runs in between six and, a, six and a half and seven, which is okay for this crop. It wouldn't be okay for bahia grass, but it's okay for bermuda grass. Uh, Let's say if it was in the acidic side and we had to apply lime, if we do the soil test right now, it allows uh, an opportunity for us to apply lime, the lime to react in the soil before the spring fertilization. So if we do the soil sampling in February or March, uh, you might not have an opportunity to correct the pH before the spring fertilization. You might have a very short window for the lime to react and usually most of the limey materials we use in Florida don't react that fast. They usually take at least three months completely solubilize in the soil and correct the pH. So this is the ideal time of the year. And usually it's cooler, not today, but hopefully it'll be cooler. So it's a little bit more pleasant to do the soil sampling and the tissue samples, the tissue sampling. Uh, sometimes, because tissue sampling is not something that we, we are used to do, there's a lot of questions how we do, and basically there's nothing uh, sci science, scientific about collecting a proper tissue sample. It's like, like a soil sample. We just want to make sure that we take multiple samples throughout the field. So if I were to sample, consider this, it would be a, a grazing base pasture. I'll just walk around the, the entire site and collect maybe 20, between 20 and 30 subsamples, mix in a bucket and grab a, a handful of sample and send to the lab. So basically there's no um, um, any sophisticated technique. For the soil sample samples, it's basically the same thing. The only thing we want to keep the depth, the soil depth, consistent. So, but basically, it, it is the same principle. Uh, any questions? If you guys want to walk around, take a look at the 